Hey traders, welcome to Top Tier Outlook for the week of whatever the week of is, the 15th? <laughs> the week of the uh, 16th. Oh my gosh, we're halfway through October. It's it's not been a smooth ride whatsoever. So first of all, one of the things that when I was cutting the video for Friday's free video back at the Simple Trading YouTube channel, I thought, you know what? Let's just lay it out. Let's talk about the difficulty of the week. Let's talk about the difficulty of the current environment and, and really start to talk openly, normalizing. You know, I mean, let's normalize losses. That's part of the game, right? But oh, no, no, no. Some people never lose. <laughs> so we're talking about on Friday. Yes, October has been difficult, but manageable. Uh, my head was just barely above water last week in terms of the... Uh, risk that we dealt with and the losses. Now, the first week of October was not bad. Obviously, I've shared my trades viz. For, I shouldn't say obviously. For those of you that may not know, uh, at countdowntrader.com, September and August, I shared my trades viz. You know, how did we do for the week day trading options? And I'll do the same thing for October. I can tell you this right now. Unless something really incredible happens, there is just no way that I'm gonna replicate what happened in September in October. And I think that brings up a common question that I get, which is, Raggy, do you have goals for the day, for the week, for the month? And I do not. My goal is to manage risk. My goal is to stick with my plan and wait for my triggers and, and adhere to my stop losses. But I do not expect a particular result from the market. Can you imagine if anyone had expectations in July uh, that looked like June. Well, they would have actually underperformed because July was straight up. June was pretty good, but July was straight up. So if I thought, gosh, if only I could replicate J June's results in July, I would have left a lot of money on the table. Equally so, if I took July's results and tried to apply them to August in terms of expectations, that would have been very difficult because August was very choppy. Ditto September. And if I thought, gosh, here's October, you know, we almost doubled an account in August, did really, really well in September, you know, in the 90s. Um, why not try to do that in, in October? I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to be, if I get half that, I'll be very, very happy. So every month presents its own challenges. We take what the market can give us. And the only thing that we can do is manage risk. So let's uh, jump into what's going on in the, in the markets right now. I'm going to open up the five minute chart. There we go. And we've got a glimpse of the hourly and we also have a glimpse of the, the daily, the daily is in, in focus here. Whenever I'm doing the top tier outlook for the sector secrets mastery members, and also the folks who subscribe to the top tier outlook, I am thinking about when I say a bigger picture, this isn't about what's going to happen a year from now as if, right? And we're doing top tier outlook. We're taking a look at the daily time frame, maybe the weekly time frame, rate of change, macroeconomics, emphasis on inflation and jobs. And we're looking at what could we possibly expect for the week, not in terms of even necessarily trades, but of direction, of synergy, of focus, right? I think this notion that on a Sunday evening, I'm going to know where we close on Friday, or on a Sunday evening, we're going to know whether it's going to be a bullish week or bearish week. You know, think about that. NFL games are going on right now, right? I don't know what the scores are going to be. And yet somehow when it comes to trading and investing, we think there are those individuals that somehow can channel future results and tell you what they are right now, right? If someone told you that with, with, with football, I know hockey season's gearing up. Someone told you that with any sport, you'd look at them and you'd roll your eyes, right? But yet... People do that all the time in the markets, and we think that they must know something that the rest of us don't. They don't. They don't. I can promise you that. The best ones understand position sizing and, under, and managing risk. So with that in mind, managing risk in terms of the NASDAQ is probably going to still be the place to go. And why is that? Last week, we sunk into the daily price movement range after a fairly, fairly significant sell-off. I mean, it was relentless on Friday. 
I'm rocking some tea today. So I really want to be honest with everybody. This in the yoga mug, in the yo in the uh, Yoda mug is uh, some Earl Grey. And so if we have a, if we have this move into the gray zone of a daily price movement range, that is the historical volatility of each session, individualized to each session going back six months. And if I have price sinking down into that zone, that gray zone, that's typically support. Now, the NASDAQ did a really good job in a neutral environment of setting, getting down into that zone. And so far, it looks like it's going to be supported. When it comes to things like the Dow, the Dow is just getting out of a downtrend, something that the NASDAQ has not done uh, this, this you know fall, September, October. There was no downtrend on the NASDAQ. Why is there a downtrend on the, on the Dow? Because there's a downtrend in financials. So if you've never thought about sort of this hierarchy, of your of your indices. How does that work in the NASDAQ? NASDAQ is actually these three sectors, XLK, XLC, and XLY. And you'll notice, even though XLY got kind of wobbly and it did turn into a downtrend for a short period of time, the other two heavily weighted sectors stayed neutral. And that's more than I can say about heavily weighted sectors in the Dow, the S&P, and the Russell. One of their heavily weighted sectors, mostly relating to financials, big banks and regionals, are in downtrends. The other heavily weighted sector, which would be XLV, healthcare, just is getting out of a downtrend. So if you're wondering why are you leaving things like the Dow and the S&P and the Russell on the back burner, because the composition of the NASDAQ is just so much better than what's going on within those three other indices. If any one of those indices is going to coattail what's going on in the NAS, it's going to be the S&P. That'll be the first. And if the S&P continues to move higher, we go right back to healthcare, we go right back to financials, and we ask, all right, are those starting to stabilize? And if they are, the down will follow suit, right? Understand these connective threads. It makes all the difference in understanding why we want to focus on what we want to focus on and what powers that engine called the index. All right. So as always, gang, this show is about your questions. Let's go ahead and jump on into them. First up is, uh, hey there, MG. How are you? Uh, always respect your transparency and love the, oh, oh, the hair. <laughs> yes, I cut my hair. Yes, I cut my hair again. So it was getting kind of long. I was talking to the Trish boss. I said, gosh, my hair's getting kind of long, huh? Um, so we cut it. I cut it, uh, let's see, last week. And then yesterday I thought, you know, it's not quite short enough. So we hacked it again. You know, the great, I mean, how many things can you cut off and they come right back? Uh, and I've got, yeah, I've got a lot of hair. I've got a thick head of hair. So it's kind of fun to hack it every now and then. But yes, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I should have done it this summer when it was hot. But uh, anyway, it's the convertible haircut. It's the convertible friendly haircut. All right. Mr. Walker asks, what I learned losing $1 million is a helpful listen. Losing is the skill. Losing well. Absolutely. I'm glad you're enjoying it. One of my absolute favorite books. Hey there, call one. Uh, thanks for the show. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I appreciate that. Can I um, can I share my thoughts on D Dog? Sure. And what is your downside target? Well, targets. Another word for target is obstacle, right? Another word for target is obstacle. So would I be bearish on D Dog? Hmm. Maybe not as bearish as call want you might think. I don't have a red trend. It's gone back into a neutral environment. I have two Darvis levels, one at 85, 25, roughly, another one at about 84, holding right now. I'm gravitating around, it's kind of going round and round near the 200 exponential. My downside target, if, right? If we were to break the support from August 8, let's say we break down through 
8380. I, I would say a really reasonable support would be somewhere around $75, $76. But not so fast, right? There's a pretty good chance we hold here. So this is where I call want. What I'll tell you is uh, very few, I'll, I'll almost say no stocks. I'm going to say very few, but almost no stocks exist on an island in and of themselves. They're going to be attached to another group of stocks, a niche, a sector, right? Some kind of grouping where they're going to move with stocks of their ilk. And most often and most easily, this will be identified, call what? via the ETF, typically one that has at least 500 to 750,000 shares traded per day, find the ETF that this has some weighting in and, and some liquidity in the ETF. And then look at the other stocks that are in that grouping. We want to know what they're doing. We want to know what stocks like D-Dog are doing because we live in a high concentration world. We live in a world where, yes, one stock can go off and do its own thing, but it's, but it's not usually very likely. It's the lower probability assumption. The higher probability assumption is find the school of fish that are moving together. That's what the S&P, NASDAQ, Dow, Russell are, right? So that's where I would look at that. I'm not that bearish. I treat this more as a chop, Kawan. I would definitely treat this more as a chop. Hey there, Yee Yee, how are you? I got the package, Yee Yee, you're too kind. I will treasure that card. Thank you so, so much. I keep meaning to tell you, I will definitely do so tomorrow in the mastery. But uh, yes, I, I the main I did. Was it that long? Yes, I, I cut it off. <laughs> I did cut it off. Uh, so for sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's not. The, you know, I was I, I've always wanted to shave my head. Seriously. I'm telling y'all, Rocky's crazy. I've always wanted to know, can you ditch your vanity and put, say, a number one or a number two to shave your head? Right. I'd be curious, you know, a la Demi Moore, G.I. Jane style. Right. Could I do that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You'll know if I do. <laughs> All right. Next up. Hey there, Nick. Does it seem to you that the Euro U.S. may be reversing direction? So, Nick, love that you're looking at the pair. I'm just going to look at the 6E, a little bit more accessible to a broader group of people, but it's the same conversation. Euro is the base currency, US dollars the second currency, and the and the moment the movement, the movement in 6E or Euro US is indicative of the strength or weakness in the Euro. So if you're looking at 6E or you're looking at Euro US on the foreign exchange, the first currency in the pair is going to be the directional currency. In other words, if Euro US is going higher, that means Euro is strengthening and US dollar is either flat or weakening. If 6E is going up, that means the 6E uh, is reflecting the euro. That means, once again, euro is strengthening and or U.S. dollar is weakening or flat. This is still a downtrend, Nick. Mm -hmm. I am. I'm not seeing much that I like. The most, the most supportive thing I can say about the euro is that perhaps it bounces from the October low again. And that was... Where the Darvis is, you'll notice the automated Darvis said, thank you very much. There's your Darvis low. And that is at 104.82. That's about as a bullish thing as I could say about the euro. So no, not yet, my friend. I really want to see that we move into a neutral, into a neutral range on the euro. Then we can think about maybe toppy dollar or, or bottoming out euro. So not quite yet. I understand that the Fed is saying they don't think further rate hikes are necessary. Thank you. So so why is the euro so weak, right? I mean, why is it the dollar weak if we're at the tail end of a tightening cycle? It's because it's not just that the Federal Reserve will stop hiking, which I agree with you. Fed fund futures say we're, for the most part, probabilistically done. However, rates are going to stay high, likely into summer of next year. That's a long time of these higher rates. And that is obviously supportive of the dollar strength. Uh, the other thing is the, the European Central Bank is a few steps behind the U.S. Central Bank when it comes to the rate hikes. So they were really still in that tightening cycle, which they seem to be a little bit walking back from what seemed to be a lot of hawkishness in June and July 
of this year. And that hawkishness strengthened the euro, weakened the dollar. And you can see what's happened since then. Going into August, actually, by the time we left August, the euro sliced down through the 200 exponential, which tells us there's some weakness here. Uh, and so I don't, I don't see any reason to change my mind about the trajectory. I won't do that just willy nilly. I'll do that when I start to see either the one hour or the daily start to go yellow. But really, if I want that more significant, more psychologically significant adjustment on the daily, it's got to be a yellow multi-trend on this end of day chart. All right. Thank you for the question, Nick. Good stuff on the currencies. Um, all right. Next question is, I need to use a JT multi. So we have something called the multi-trend, gang. Um, we've, we've tweaked it a lot over the years. We don't really call it the JT multi anymore. We just call it the multi-trend. The top row is a multi-momo. The bottom row is the multi-trend. And uh, I use the multi-trend all the time to, to wait. Yes, great point. Um, I use it to help me... Remind me to wait longer before fading a trend. We never really want to fade a trend, do we? We want to uh, buy pullbacks and uptrends, short into bounces and downtrends, and then fade chop, right? What is a fade? That means that as there's strength into a ceiling and a range, we're looking for long puts or shorting. And as there's weakness into support, again, in a range, we buy that zone. So I'm, I'm with you. I, I think that you know, when people ask, what's the most important indicator on your screen? I'd have to say it would be the foundation for everything else that I do or every other decision that I make. And if context is everything, that means structure dictates strategy, right? The context for weakness can't just be the market's weak. Is the market weak in an uptrend? Is the market weak in a downtrend? Is the market weak in chop, right? Context is everything. That's why structure dictates strategy. And for me, the ultimate decoder ring for structure is the multi-trend. And, and, and that's that lower row of those two zones of color. So I'm with you. It's, it's probably the most important thing on my screen. All right. John asks, at five minutes before the hour, does the hourly price movement range tend to point to whether the next hour's Hourly price movement range, support and resistance are moving up, down, or compressing. They'll start to show you. They'll start to show you uh, where it's the most likely to be, John. They will start to. Sh you can see where the HPMRs and where the uh, least of the HPMRs are potentially going to be plotting. But I wait for three minutes past the hour, so I'm not trying to, try to get a jump. Actually, I'm not trying to get a jump on the next hours zones at all. I'm still actually going to use the previous hour zones for about three, for about three minutes. All right. Um, he says cute mug. Yeah. I've, <laughs> it's one of my many, you know, I know it's, it's not Yoda. It's Grogu. Yeah. It's one of my many Grogu mugs. I mean, who doesn't love Grogu? Yeah. Thanks. And ye, I'm going to be making some of that coffee that you made me. I'll be putting it in this mug. I'll be sure to I'll be sure to give you a shout out when I do. All right. So, uh, so yeah, John, so I'm not even looking at the projected levels, um, which is really only on thinkorswim anyway. I am looking at the levels that are still, so for example, if I'm using a nine to 10 AM hourly price movement range, I'm not even going to think about shifting to the new ones until 10 Oh three. So I give about three minute overlap into the fresh hour. And that, that works quite well. That works actually really, really well. Um, all right. So next up is BLP asks, how do, how do the events in the Middle East factor into my pre-market analysis? BLP, as awful as what's going on there is, there are not words to describe just what's going on there and just the awfulness of it, but it has nothing to do with the markets. It, it really doesn't. Um, I know a lot of folks are making a lot of what's going on there. The same thing happened with Ukraine. So these things that happen that are awful, these awful things in humanity and what's going on in our world of stocks and futures and treasuries and currencies, um, there isn't as much overlap as a lot of folks would think. And uh, I have found very little that has superseded what the Federal Reserve is doing what economic data is saying, and overall trends. So no, I, I actually don't factor it in at all because it hasn't been a factor. It's one of those things that gets talked about in the news, 
But is it really changing the way that Apple's trading? Is it really changing the way that, frankly, even crude oil's trading? Um, you know, a lot of folks said, oh, crude's going to do, you know, if crude's going to fly now. I said, not so fast, right? Look what crude's been doing. So all those places that we would think logically should, should map to a certain result because we think whether it was Ukraine, whether, you know, it's what's going on in the Middle East, whatever it is, it doesn't map like most people think because frankly, for the most part, it usually is not a factor to the stocks and to the sectors in the indices. And even something like crude oil, we would think would be very, very um, sensitive to that. It really hasn't been. So it doesn't factor in at all, my friend. Um, again, I, I haven't found it to be moving the market in a way that would suggest that there is a concern about, oh, crude's going to go higher. Um, you know, bond yields are already heading lower. So could this be a reason that bond yields are continuing to, to head lower? They really haven't been heading that much lower. Um, or even that much higher. They're just sort of stuck in a range. Oh, clearly everyone's going to be looking at gold. Maybe yes, maybe no, right? The reason I make gold a little bit different is, I'll tell you, I was trading Gulf 1 from my dorm room, and everyone thought the play was going to be in crude. It actually ended up being in gold. So I would say if you're looking, you know, separate, separate BLP, the, the different markets, because most are not tracking with what's happening there. Gold is probably going to be your best bet. All right. Green eggs and ham. When playing options, do I have a time stop instead of a level day trading time frame? Do I have a time stop instead of level day trade? Um, well, if I'm understanding the question, uh, green eggs and ham, I want to be out of my day trades by 3.50, 3.50 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'm usually going to start thinking about slowing down my entries by 1035 Eastern. Some days will extend that window to 1055 Eastern. So yeah, time plays a big role, but it's not the reason I get in or get out, right? It is not the reason I would get in or get out. It's the reason I would ask myself, well, as we get close to the London fix, do I have an edge? As I complete the first hour of the day, do we have the synergy in the broader averages? Are they moving together, right? And if I don't, I'll usually you know, say thanks, but no thanks after 1035. Most of my day trades uh, occur in the first 65 minutes. So I'm not an advocate of day trading all day at all. You know, I'm more an advocate of looking at the trading results that we have and asking myself, ask yourself, what time of day did you put on the bulk of your trades that yielded the bulk? Not all, right? It's not always going to be all. What is the time frame? the time of day, the whatever factor you want to measure, what yielded 80% of your results? And that's where Pareto principle, 80-20, does tend to apply to darn near everything. You're going to find there's about 20% of things out there that, that give you your 80% of positive results. Our job then is to go as all in on that 20% as possible. So if I know the first hour of the day is by far the disproportionate gains that I'll experience as a day trader, I want to go kind of all in on that time of day, be ready to go. Know that that's where I want to put on the most of my trades. Uh, the notion that the whole day is going to be equally as productive, I have not found out over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trades over the years, decades even. Uh, I have not found that to be true. I have found that if I want to buy my time back as a trader, right? Of course, financial freedom is is what we you know. There's, there, I remember reading an article about there's certain freedoms. We want the freedom to, you know, hang out with the kind of people we want to hang out with, right? Freedom of relationships, freedom of time, freedom of finance. I think there's one more freedom in that book, and I'm doing a terrible job, but uh, I think it's Dan Sullivan. I think I'm actually heard this from John. Now that I think about it, and there's certain freedoms that we're all looking for. One of them is freedom of time, right? Freedom to time, freedom to hang out with who we want to hang out with, um, freedom to do what we want to do, and freedom of money. Well. If I want to buy back my time, it's really my job then to figure out what time of day as a trader are going to yield most of the results, then go enjoy as much of my life as I can. But this isn't about when can I go for a picnic, set it and forget it, this, this lifestyle trading thing. That's not it at all, right? Because if you were coming up in the 80s and 90s as a trader, as I was, that was all the rage, right? Everyone was telling you what a great lifestyle you can have. You know, that's old, 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 you know, thinking really what it is now, because we have these nearly 24-hour markets now, 
is when are you most productive as a trader? Where are your profits coming from? For some, it's the end of the day. For some, it's the beginning of the day. For some, it's the Asian session. For others, it's the European. You, it just doesn't, it's not going to be the same. It doesn't matter what time you're most productive. It's, it's really knowing what your most productive time is and going all, all in there, buying back your time. And so for me, that's how I do it, right? So a lot of those time-based, those restrictions are not because I want to put my trades on and go party, party, party. No, you know, I'm not going to go play a round of golf and get my trades in to do that. I'm optimizing when my best trade results occur. I hope that makes sense. And great question. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Bogus asked, is using so many indicators helpful? Well, fair question. And I appreciate the question. So it's, you know, I kind of imagine it this way. If I were to walk onto a jet plane to travel and I turn around and I look at the cockpit and I look at the pilot and I say, gosh, what do you need all those gauges and dials for? Right. All that really says is I don't know what those gauges and dials and levers and buttons are for. But he does or she does. The pilot does. So I'm the pilot of my charts and all these indicators tell me something that each has a job. Right. But again, the same way that I would look at a cockpit of a 757 or whatever of an Airbus, whatever, and, and look at all those and not know what any of that means. It's the same way that maybe another trader would look at a chart and say, I don't know what those things mean. Now, ultimately, I may not need all the gauges and dials, right? I may not need them. But yes, of course. Otherwise, you know, are they helpful to me? Yes, they're helpful to me because I know what each one is telling me. Just like that pilot on that giant jet plane knows what each dial and each button and each lever does for the plane to properly fly it. Same thing. Same thing. So yes, for me, absolutely. Absolutely. So fair question. I get that from time to time. And and thank you for asking um, in a very nice way, because it's really funny. Every now and then I'll get a comment from someone, anonymous 76548, you know, which is just code for troll. You know, they'll say something like naked charts. You know, if you're a real trader, naked charts, really? Pretty sure Paul Tudor Jones had indicators. Pretty sure that Jim Simons, arguably one of the greatest traders, has indicators and things that he's crunching with the computers. So it always cracks me up. Naked charts. But if that works for if that works for one trader, great. But this notion that that my and my indicators might be different from another successful trader's indicators. It's not just one set of gauges and dials, right? So I think the cool thing about my being able to reach out to all you and show you what I do is show you why I do what I do and see if it resonates. With, with you all, right? This way you can sort of preview what it is I do and say, Rog, that's not for me. Or Rog, I think I want to learn more. And that's all I can do at this stage of my career, right? Where I know the markets have been very good to me and mine, you know, taking care of my family and myself for so many years. And I'm thinking I would like other traders to experience what I've been able to experience. So I share what's, what's on my screen. Thank you for the question though. All right, gang. And just like that, our show is up. I've been shortening it usually to about 20 minutes. Um, let me grab a few more questions. And what are the market hours for London? Peter, 2 a.m. Eastern, 2 a.m. Eastern. Um, do I see a lot of chop this week? Anthony, I have no idea. No, so I can't predict what's going to happen, right? And just like you said, I mean, look at all the events we have coming up, right? I have no idea if it's going to be choppy this week. It depends on what the data is, right? So, but great for, for grabbing the data hot zones, right? What's a hot zone? It's a term that I coined many, many moons ago, I think in my first book, where it's a high impact, right? High volatility, high volume event that is scheduled. And if we know these events are coming out, there's going to be discounting. There's going to be people jockeying around for position in front of the event. Uh, but the event itself, the number itself, the reaction itself, you know, look what happened with the uh, University of Michigan in inflation expectations and consumer sentiment on Friday. We're actually heading up, had a really good morning. That data comes out at 10 a.m. and whoosh, right? And so that's, we don't know, right? But you know the most important thing, Anthony. You know what is coming out and when, all right? 
All right. So that is a wrap as always gang. Thank you so much for being here for charts and co uh, charts and coffee for top tier outlook. We're together here every Sunday from six to about six 20 um, rolled over a little bit. Great questions today. And on, um, on Monday, starting uh, every weekday, we've been doing this for almost three years now. Uh, on Monday, I'll see you all 9 a.m. for a 20-minute pre-market show before I hop into the rooms. Uh, it's Charts and Coffee at 9 a.m. Eastern right here at the Simpler Trading YouTube channel as well as my YouTube channel. Yeah, I think this October, I think this month or next month is going to be three years, I think. I'll have to double check. I think it's going to be three years of... Charts and coffee. Unbelievable. Thank you all. I couldn't have done it without you all. Amazing. When I first started doing charts and coffee, I think there were 10 people showing up and we, we consistently have hundreds and hundreds of views. So yeah, I think three years this month. Amazing. All right, gang, be good to each other. I'll see you tomorrow.